Also called the altered dominant scale or the super locrian scale those are all the same thing those are all just the altered scale how should we go about practicing this on the guitar to get it down and how do we use it in real music well that's what we're going to talk about in this lesson i've done a bunch of other videos on how to map out and practice various types of scales i will put a link to that in the description if you need a resource for finding and working on the multiple positions and how to play all over the guitar, any other type of scale. I'm going to explain the theory of the altered scale so we can understand how it's structured, where it comes from, and I have a simple way to think about that that I think you will find very useful. Then I'm going to show you the five positions of the altered scale so we can play it anywhere on the neck and in any off of any root and i'm going to recommend specifically how to go about practicing those positions that is a really important exercise to um, understand it and hear it correctly <laughs> I'm Jared Borkowski from SoundGuitarLessons.com. On this channel, I talk a ton about music theory and jazz guitar and arranging and improvisation and really just a wide variety of topics, but all designed to help us get more creative control over music, over the instrument, over the guitar, so we can express ourselves more freely. If you're new here, welcome, and please subscribe and hit the bell so you get notified when I put out new lessons. All right, let's go ahead and talk about the theory of the altered scale. First, to understand this, we want to talk about what an altered chord is. I love this because I remember so clearly when I was first taught what an altered chord is. My guitar teacher said an altered chord is a dominant seventh chord where the five and the nine are mangled. And I just that just really stuck in my brain. The five and the nine are mangled. Dominant seventh chord, five is mangled, the nine is mangled. And you know that's not anything, uh, that's no technical term of course, but the five is if it was a natural five, you split it into a flat five and a sharp five, and there's a natural nine usually, and you split it into a flat nine and a sharp nine. So they're mangled. They're just all messed up. They're not natural. You don't have those natural, the natural five or natural nine. You have the two versions of those that are uh, a half step apart on both sides of them. So we have a dominant seventh chord with flat five, sharp five, and flat nine, sharp nine. So that's a really straightforward way to, to think about this. If we start with a shell voicing, and I always recommend that we think about this stuff along one string first before we kind of make it more complicated and go crossing strings. So let's look at a shell voicing. And if you need to, uh, if you wanna understand the power of shell voicings, I'll put a link to a video where I walk through uh, how to use them uh, below. I will also put a link to a video about extensions. So if you're not sure what nine is, it's the same as two, but I have, uh, uh, videos explaining that stuff. I'll put it in the description. So we're going to outline a shell voicing here. One, three, flat seven. So that's the just the essential notes of this um, C dominant seventh chord. So I'm going to actually, I have it on the screen here for you. So we're going to say, okay, we have one, three, and flat seven. One, here's flat seven here. One, here's three. There's flat seven. One. Okay, so let's just really see that clearly. Okay, one, three, one, flat seven, one, three, here's flat seven, here's one. Okay, we should be able to see that. It's an unusual place to outline a chord along one string, but I find that that linear perspective is very helpful. But now the altered scale, which is this kind of elusive complex um, scale that we think of as, as very advanced. But now if we do understand that, that um, shell voicing and then we just fill in the mangled five and the mangled nine, uh, then we have that flat five, sharp five, and flat nine, sharp nine. So uh, nine is the same as two. So, okay, well, nine is usually just a whole step above the root. So here's a flat nine right there. And okay, there's the sharp nine right there. And there's the three. Okay, we have those two notes added. We know the flat seven is there. Okay, usually the five is here, would be on G in this case. There's flat five, there's sharp five. That's the whole scale. That's the whole altered scale. I love thinking of it that way, because then it's... 
um, then you just know you have one, you have that dominant seventh chord, one, three, flat seven, the shell voicing, and then you just add those mangled notes and you have the entire scale. That's it, I'll do it one more time. One, flat seven, one, flat nine, sharp nine, three, flat five, sharp five, flat seven, one. I find this to be, um, superior definitely to then thinking of like okay i gotta remember half step then whole step then half step then whole step then whole step um even though that could be accurate to think of it that way i i don't think it helps um our it's not helpful for our memory of the scale at all so that is how we're we are going to be thinking of the structure of the scale surrounding that altered chord so interestingly i went into this talking about the altered chord first and then the altered scale and it's like well where did where did i stop talking about one and start talking about the other well every note of the altered scale is a chord tone of an altered chord. They are one and the same thing. The altered scale is a scale version of an altered chord. So you could say you're playing the altered scale or you could say you're playing chord tones of an altered chord. One, flat seven is a chord tone. One, flat nine is a chord tone. Flat sharp nine is a chord tone. Three is a chord tone. Flat five is a chord tone. Sharp five is a chord tone. Flat seven is a chord tone. Right, so on the guitar, we're obviously not playing altered chords where we're playing all of those at once because we're limited to, at the most, six notes at a time. Uh, so a lot of times an altered chord would just be, you just add a sharp nine, or you add a flat nine, or you add a sharp five, or you add a flat five, and you can include bigger voicings where you're playing the sharp five and flat nine at the same time or different combinations of that. I usually stick to at the most four notes at a time and you know I'll jump to different voicings of four notes to get bigger sounds and that makes it sound like it's moving around a little more um, dynamically as well instead of the the five note chords. That's just my approach. Okay now that I explained it that way now I want to share with you where it comes from what parent scale it comes from. Now usually this is the first thing someone will say if they're explaining the altered scale. And I've done that before too, but I prefer to think of scales, uh, every type of scale, including modes, as really their own structure, right? Where, where I'm really thinking of the root of that scale or the root of that mode. But a lot of scales share the same notes as other scales and that's what modes are. I'll put a link to my uh, modes playlist in the description if you wanna learn more about that. But uh, the altered scale is the seventh mode of melodic minor. I did a video just recently um, talking about melodic minor itself and how to just play that scale everywhere. Well, the notes, the structure is the exact same as melodic minor. Um, and the altered scale is the seventh mode. So whatever the seventh, seventh note of melodic minor is, if you call that one and move all the numbers around, then you have the altered scale or super locrian is another name for that as a mode. So therefore, the way we map this out along the fifth string, if we make D flat the root, um, then it's just a D flat melodic minor scale or C sharp melodic minor scale either way. So um, if it's that, then we'll go one, two, flat three, four, five, six, seven, one, one, seven, six, five, four, flat three, two, one, seven, six, seven, one. And again, I have that video on, on the uh, melodic minor scale if you wanna kind of understand what the deal is with that and what the structure is there. Uh, now, if I make the root C, like we've been doing before, then it's the altered scale. So they're one and the same. So. They're one and the same in terms of the structure and the, the note selection of what you call a root is what makes it different. That's the whole deal with modes. That's how they work. So, um, you know, what's really different? It's how you're treating it. It's how, um, what your kind of main home base note is. So since it's all about that main home base note, uh, we need to practice our scales and our scale forms or scale, however we're practicing scales, we need to be super aware of hearing and addressing that main note, what we're thinking of as the one or the root. We need to treat that differently so we can really internalize the sense of the scale. Because if you do just practice this and say, oh, I'm just gonna think of the melodic minor scale and know that I placed it in the right place to be the altered scale. And a lot of people do that and it definitely works. It sounds like the right notes, but in my experience, it is disorienting because I'm not actually thinking of the true root of the chord or the scale that I'm trying to play on. So I always recommend that we play scales with something I call the root to root exercise or the root to root method. I walk through this in all the other scales videos that I've done and I just think it's the most powerful way to map stuff out um, and not get confused about what frets we're supposed to be playing between all these multiple positions of the same scale. So I'm gonna go ahead and demonstrate that. So this first position that you see on the screen here, um, if C is the root and that's our C altered scale, I wanna play start on the root and then just play up and when I get to the next root, I want to 
repeat that route again. I like to pause a little bit too. You don't have to pause, but you have to repeat it for this exercise. So you pause on that and then you repeat it. And then you go up. And you can only pause or repeat on the root, right? So that I, with this scale position, the top note is not a root, so I can't pause there, I can't repeat it, which is very common. A lot of times we will play scale forms from the lowest note. And then repeat that. Right? That's good for getting the shape down, but it's not getting, it's not targeting those roots, not seeing where they are, we're not hearing it as the scale. So I think this is very transformative for how we're trying to understand any scale. So again, I'll demonstrate, pause and repeat, turn around, there's the root again, pause and repeat, there it is again, and gotta play what's underneath it. Ah, so you're starting on, you're repeating or pausing on, and then you're ending on the root and you're not emphasizing any other note. You're not doing that to any other note. So we get the sense of the scale. So here's the next position um, in out of the five scale forms. Okay, so as, as weird of a scale as this is, this is the way to start to see it clearly. Okay, that one happens to have the lowest note as the root. Okay, so the next one I have to start up here on the fourth string. It's the lowest root that we have. Okay, and then one more, starting here. Okay, so that's how you start to map out just the physical positions, the scale forms, all the places that you can play it, and seeing the root clearly, all of that. So the next thing to do is just to jam in each scale form. And then I'll give you the two exercises that are different than that even, but really with any scale form and um, any mode or whatever, we want to play in all the positions and jam a little bit, just hanging out with that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play over a backing track that is just an alt chord. Um, it's just going to be C7 altered, and I'm just going to jam a little bit in each position so you can hear that. So did you catch where I played some wrong notes there? Not, I'm not talking about the part mm -hmm. where I, an open string accidentally happened because that definitely sounded wrong, but um, a, a spot where I played actually some notes outside of the scale and then I reacted to it by playing a bunch of chroma chromatic notes in a row and then getting myself back into the correct spot. So it's possible that that went unnoticed and I wanted to bring it up because we have to embrace that stuff when we are improvising. And that's really what people are doing all the time, especially in the aesthetic of jazz music jazz improvisation. And so that's happening all the time. And as listeners, we don't notice it. We just think, whoa, cool th hip thing that they did there, right? We don't know if it's on purpose or not. So that is something to embrace with our improvisation. And I know early on in working on improvisation, uh, we get really concerned about, am I playing the right notes or, or whatnot? We definitely want to map out all those you know, right notes, but we, we need to really be okay with 
Um, there, there are no wrong notes. There are the kind of parameters and the structures we're working on, and then everything is just a sound. And so we need to react to that. So anyway, I wanted to bring that up, see if you noticed that, that spot that I did that, and then reacted to it and kind of got back into the scale. Because I actually liked that spot very much. And if I was so concerned about all the right notes, or if I was like, oh, I messed up, I'm going to do another take of it or something like that, I wouldn't have had that that moment in there that I actually thought sounded pretty cool. So everything that we've talked about so far to do is really important, really necessary, but that up to that point mapping out and, and even improvising in every scale form, that is where a lot of us with our improvisation work, that's where we stop, right? We can get really comfortable and feel like we sound good even with that, but then using it in a chord progression is a kind of a different story. It's another leap that we have to take because especially something like this, the altered scale, altered chords, they often come up in chord progressions as like one bar at a time or even two beats at a time. And an, another use of this, and you know, when something is an altered chord, yes, of course we know, cool, altered scale is going to work. But another use for this to really apply it to things is that you can alter a dominant seventh chord anytime, right? Any normal dominant seventh chord, you can just treat it as altered to get a little bit of an outside, uh, more dissonant sound, even for just a couple beats, and then go back to um, the consonants or the, the tonality or the chord tones of the actual chord or whatever. So, um, that is, that's the thing that we want to kind of be working towards. And in order to really use it in real music, we need to practice it in a way where we're switching between something that we're comfortable with and then to the new thing that we're working on in this case, the altered scale. So for now, just definitely get comfortable with the altered scale shapes and forms and play around with them. And then I will do a part two on how to work on on the altered scale in the context of a real chord progression. And there's specific ways to work on that that I think are the most effective. So that's gonna be really cool and I'll do that in a few videos. For now, just get used to the sound in general and what we talked about in this lesson. One more thing about scales, and that's that I always recommend with every scale that we learn that we make sure we can do uh, a few melodic patterns with it, especially a melodic thirds pattern is always the first one that I recommend. <laughs> So that's playing that first scale form out of those five with a melodic thirds pattern where you're going up a third, then down one, then up a third from there and down one and, and so on. So I always, I always recommend doing that. So I created a little download PDF sheet of the top three pentatonic scale melodic patterns to work on improvising with. Since the pentatonic scale is so fun to improvise with and so common, I kind of put them into that format. but. Uh, Two of those can be applied to any scale. And so I have a free uh, download link for that in the description if you want to get it so you have kind of a little exercise sheet in front of you, which is super fun and helpful for our improvisations. So they don't just sound like scales uh, going up and down when we try to solo, they can be a little more melodic. So I have a question for you. If you are familiar with modes in general and how they work, do you agree with my opinion that I want to see every mode, like the altered scale. I want to see the root of it as the root. I want to see it totally as its own scale. When I was improvising all, all through those examples, I was not thinking of the melodic minor scale and then just kind of placing it where it can fit as the seventh mode of the melodic minor scale. I'm really, really thinking of it as its own scale. I'm seeing flat three and natural three. I'm seeing the, you know, the chord tones as they are, where the flat nine is, that kind of thing. So that's my opinion. It does take more work to get to that point, but I just don't find the other way of doing it where you're just thinking of a parent scale. I just, I find it, it feels easier to get lost to me. The reason I ask this, and if, if you're not in, if you're not in on this debate, it's kind of a, it's kind of a heated topic as, as heated as something like this guitar scales can be on the internet. Um, a lot of people think that it's, it's a stupid way to practice to think of the mode separately when you could just use the parent scale structure. So weigh in if you have a thought on that. Um, I know Jens Larsen, the uh, very excellent YouTube jazz guitar teacher, um, he talks a lot about how um, how that's a dumb way to practice the modes, but I disagree. And uh, so if you if you l land on one side or the other of that, uh, let me know in the comments. And uh, a lot of what I talk about is how to you know play around the root, and that is this way of really thinking of the mode. So I thought I'd open that up to see what other people think about it. I post a new lesson video every week. Next week is going to be a little demonstration and uh, kind of a review of the finger picks that I've used for years and years. And people always ask me about them on this channel. So I'm going to talk about them. They're called Alaska picks and they're kind of unique and weird. Uh, so I'm just going to do a walkthrough of how they work for finger style guitar and hybrid playing. 
Hope to see you there next week. Thanks for watching. Take care and happy practicing.